Revelation chapter 9 now. Since chapter 6, we've been <clears throat> looking at these various judgments that God has unleashed on the earth. The first wave of that judgment was called the, the seal judgments. And last week in chapter 8, we saw the seventh seal opened, which released another whole wave of judgments called the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments consist of seven specific judgments, the first four of which have devastated the earth. Remember last week in chapter 8, we saw that the first trumpet, trumpet brought a sort of botanical devastation, one-third of the vegetation of the earth having been destroyed, no doubt putting further pressure on the famines that we read about previous to that. The second trumpet brought oceanic devastation, as one-third of the sea creatures were killed. Also, one-third of the ships were destroyed, and no doubt affecting areas of manufacturing and trade and commerce and military defense and all these things that people are involved in. The third trumpet brought a hydrological devastation as one-third of the fresh water of the earth was poisoned. And we we're told there that it killed many men. And then when the fourth trumpet sounded, there was cosmic devastation and one-third of the sun's light and one-third of the stars was expunged, no doubt causing more environmental stress, right? Limited growth energy, cooler world temperatures, who knows, right? More food shortages. At this point in time, gang, it's all bad news. The only good news is the gospel going forth in the most miserable time in human history. Now, the last verse of chapter 8, we read this. John says, And I looked, and I heard an angel, or an eagle, flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. The last three judgments, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet judgments, are the three woes that this angel declares. Now, it's interesting because what we read in this particular chapter, we'll only get through half the chapter this morning, but the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, there's more information given regarding those than there is the previous four judgments before. Now, why is that? I believe it's because of the horror that we're about to see. There are things that are, you can't even equate to the human experience, the things that are going to be unleashed on this earth. And so John takes great effort to give us a lot of details. So with that disclaimer in mind, let's, uh, let's read the first 12 verses of chapter 9, and then we'll start to break it down. John writes, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened, opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like a woman's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like, the breast, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sounds of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Great. 
you know, I will admit that the first time I taught the book of Revelation, I was so excited, and then I got to these chapters, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Now it's the fourth time I've taught through this book, and it gets heavier and heavier every time. Let's begin to break it down then. Verse 1, then the angel, the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So a fifth note is now played in this bitter melody, and the first woe begins. He says, I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. The word fallen here, it's in the perfect tense. That means it's already occurred. John doesn't say, I saw a star falling to earth. He says, I I saw a star that had fallen to earth. And the word star here is in the masculine and not in the neuter. So it's more than a something, it's a someone. Who is this star? We're never actually told. Uh, In the, the natural understanding of the day, it would be an angelic being of some kind. <clears throat> when God interrogates Job, beginning in Job chapter 38. Remember, he asked Job certain questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you, Job, when I did this? Speaking all of creation. And in that, in in verse 7 of Job chapter 38, the Lord qualifies that point in time. He says this, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He's speaking about the angelic praise that was there as God created the heavens and the earth. And so we would naturally understand this to be an angelic being, certainly within the Jewish mind of the time, and and even prior to that, this would have been seen as an angelic being. Now, many commentators believe this is Satan specifically because of what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Isaiah wrote, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Right? Consider also what we'll read in the 12th chapter in about 20 years when we get there. We're told that he drew a a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So we would technically sort of understand this potentially as Satan. We're never told it's Satan. I don't see that it has to be, but it's as good a guess as any. But the primary focus is not on who the angel is. It's on what the angel is does. And we're told that to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this nameless angel then has been given a key to a bottomless pit. If he's been given a key, then he's been given a purpose and the authority then to fulfill that purpose, right? Where did he get the key from? I would suggest Jesus Christ because in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18, Jesus said, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. I have the keys of Hades and death. See, the Lord's authority has been delegated for the purposes of unleashing hell on the earth. Now, the the phrase bottomless pit, right? Bottomless is, is the Greek word abuso, from which we get the word abyss. It literally means depthless, It's something without depth, and so therefore it's understood as the abyss. The word pit, fraer, it it speaks of like a well. It has like a shaft life, uh, a shaft like quality about it. You'd think of it as as a well. The ancient rabbis viewed hell as within the earth. Um, which I always thought was kind of weird, but the older I get, the more I begin to see the viability of that kind of idea. But when they looked at the abyss, it's sort of like a space without material parameters. It's just space. There's no sky. There's no ground, right? It's just space. And so in that sense, it's sort of described as being bottomless. It's a, it's a murky concept. It develops over the course of, 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 of Judaism and the Christian world. It, it's kind of developed quite a bit. What we do know is this. It's not a nice place to be. And we read that in Luke chapter 8, in verses 26 to 33. You know the story, right? Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And he who stepped 
uh, and when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time, and he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And then we read this. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Then, of course, you know the story. Jesus casts them out and they then go into a herd of swine and force the swine off a cliff and it just gets weirder and weirder, doesn't it? But it's evident here then that the demonic entities do not want to be in the abyss. It's a place of torment to them. It's a place of misery, and they don't want to be there. So if this angel's been given a key to open up this bottomless pit, you know nothing's good going to come out of this, right? Verse 2, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So this angel opens up the abyss, and what comes out first is smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. Now, you've got to remember, in ancient times, even up until modern times, furnaces didn't have scrubber systems that remove particulates and all that kind of stuff, right? In, in the old days, dilution was the solution to pollution. Nor did ancient furnaces have, you know, great oxygen, you know, distribution systems, and so, you know... Uh, Things burned dirty. Ancient furnaces belched out black smoke full of particulates, right? It was, that was normal until really the most recent decades. Even now, as I think about it, when I was a kid, my father worked at a local foundry. And I remember the smoke coming out of, out of the, uh, the stack at that foundry, and I can even smell the soot today, you know. And we're told this, so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So wherever the entrance to this pit was, the sun was eclipsed by the smoke that came out of it. You almost get the sense that something volcanic is going on. The atmosphere is choked with the black fumes of hell itself. It almost reminds you of Mordor. For those of you who are like Lord of the Rings fans, you know, just terrible. Verse 3, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Well, unfortunately then it wasn't just smoke that came out of this pit, but locusts came out with it. What had previously been bound in the pit has now been unbound. You have to understand now that this is terrifying language to the ancients. Uh, locusts were, were symbolic of destruction, right? A, a, a single swarm could darken the skies over entire regions. Then they would decimate the crops, causing famine, and death was caused really almost indiscriminately. Now, we're never told how many of the locusts come out of the pit, but the fact that their locusts would... would would infer then it's like a swarm, <clears throat> even billions in number. They're, I mean, they're in the billions and billions. There are swarms of locusts that can cover a thousand square miles. Just incredible. But these ones aren't ordinary locusts, are they? They're straight out of hell. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Power here, uh, the, the word would be indicative more of liberty. They've given, been given a certain liberty or in a certain ability like that of the scorpion. Now, what's the scorpion known for? Yeah, inflicting pain, right? Something that grasshoppers do not do. You know, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. Two, two animals are, just suffer horribly at the hands of young boys, grasshoppers and frogs. Amen? 
Yeah, we'll read about both of them in this chapter, interestingly. But we would play with grasshoppers all the time. We would shish kebab them on pine needles, or you stick them in a cigar tube, you freeze them overnight, you know, take them out the next day, you play with them because they kind of come back. It's a boy thing. I, you women are horrified, but, you know, if you knew what your little kids were doing, you know. But I never saw a, a, a grasshopper with a stinger. And if I did, I would have run like the plague. I wouldn't be playing with it, that's for sure. John will expound more when we get to verse 5 and then verse 10 regarding this scorpion-like quality that these things have. <clears throat> so we see their origination. Now, verse 4, we see their mission. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, the typical locust obviously eats vegetation but doesn't harm people. These ones are quite different. They don't harm the vegetation, but they do harm people. <clears throat> this is interesting because if you notice, up to this point, God has been waging environmental warfare on the earth, right? A third of the trees have been burned up. A third of the oceans are lifeless. A third of the fresh water sources have been poisoned. But now these judgments begin to take a new focus. It's no longer environmental. It seems to be personal now because they're told that they can harm people instead. See, this army of demonic locusts have one purpose, to harm people. Its mission is to inflict pain, not on the environment, but on the populace. And yet we read not everyone, only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Well, who are they? Well, we read about them. Previously, in chapter 7, there was 144,000 Jewish men who were set aside. The seal of God was put on their foreheads. And there we noticed several things in Revelation chapter 7. Between verses 3 and 8, we read that they're God's servants. We read that there's that specific number of them, 144,000. And we also read that there's 12,000 from the 12 tribes that are listed in Revelation 7 verses 5 to 8. We also noted from Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5, that they're morally pure. They follow the Messiah, and they speak the truth. This is a remnant of Jewish believers that God has set aside, I believe, for the purpose of sharing the gospel. And the evidence of their ministry is the innumerable company of souls that stand before the throne. And the elder came to John and said, these are those who've come out of the tribulation. They've been martyred for their faith. See, these 144,000 have been sealed with the seal of God, and therefore they're protected from his judgment. And each group has its marching orders, right? The 144,000 are sharing the gospel. The locusts are going after those who reject the gospel. And they don't interfere with one another because in the end they're serving the same master. How's everybody feeling? I'll be honest with you, this has been affecting my sleep at night lately. I'm dreaming about these kind of things now. Yeah, it's an interactive experience. Verse 5. <laughs> and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I think I would take notice here that the the purpose of these locusts is not punitive, it's motivational. If God wanted to kill these men, he'd give these locusts the ability to kill them. But he doesn't. He only gives them the ability to inflict pain. See, pain has a way, gang, of causing us to consider things that we didn't previously want to consider, doesn't it? It will reprioritize your life if you let it. And God has been forcing non-believers to consider things that they had previously not considered, things that they wouldn't consider. And that is the reality of sin and judgment, and even hell itself. And, and how many of you would say, this, this judgment seems kind of cruel? 
Yeah, okay, thank you for you four honest people at Calvary Chapel this morning, you know. Let's take note of a couple things here. Number one, the commanded not to harm the earth's plant life. See, this, this swarm, this horde, if you would, has a leash on it. There are certain things they're not allowed to do. They're not allowed to hurt the plant life. They're told not to harm God's servants. And they're allowed to torment, not to kill. So as cruel as this may seem, at least initially, God's mercy and grace can still be seen in it. This, this swarm of locusts is, is being sent forth for the purpose of motivating people to make careful thought of sin and judgment, as well as mercy and grace, should they repent. You see, the church, I believe, is not on the earth at this particular time. If you're a pre-tribber or even a mid-tribber, by this point in time, the church is no longer on the earth. But 2 Peter 3.9 is still in play. The Lord is not slack concerning His purpose, that is, to judge the world, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Will all men come to repentance? No. But is that their will or God's will? It's their will. And we're told that the torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. The word torment here, basanizo, it speaks of torturous pain. Now, I've been stung by a few things in my life, like you. I've had my yellow jackets and wasps. A couple years ago, I got stung by a jellyfish right under the armpit. Oh, that was a good one, you know. But these things are far worse than a bee sting or a jellyfish. How much worse? John tells us in verse 6, in those days men will seek death and they won't find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Now, it's obvious then the sting of of these locusts is non-fatal, but it's so non-fatal that people actually wish it was fatal. It's so bad that people would prefer to die than to live. And I honestly, gang, I tell you, I find that very disturbing. While people in misery should seek after God, instead they're seeking death. There are people who would simply rather die than repent. That is the hardness of the human heart. And God is sending wave after wave of judgment on the earth. He could wipe it out in a snap of his fingers, but he doesn't. Wave after wave that people would repent, that people would repent. Sadly, most don't. And if that wasn't bad enough, death remains elusive, and they won't find the relief that they think that death will bring. Does this sound familiar, any students of Greek mythology here? You guys ever hear of the the Greek myth of Eos and Tithonius? Nobody? Oh, this is going to be new. Okay. This is how the myth goes. True story. Well, within... Greek mythology, anyway. Eos was the, go- the goddess of the dawn, and she fell in love with a mortal man named Tithonius. And as the years went on, Eos retained her youth as a goddess, but Tithonius, as a mortal man, continued to age. And understanding what they would face in the future, Tithonius asked her to grant him immortality. She couldn't, so she went and she talked to Zeus, and Zeus reluctantly fulfilled the request and gave the man immortality. Unfortunately, the story doesn't have a happy ending. Tithonius asked for eternal life, but he forgot to ask for eternal youth. And so, unable to die, he continued to to age and to grow increasingly decrepit. And he pleaded with his lover to help him, but she couldn't take back the gift of immortality, nor could she give him back his youth. So you know what she did? Here's the weird thing. She turned him into a grasshopper. It's a sad but stupid story. Uh, and it's my pleasure to share it with you. So do with that as you want. Yeah. <laughs> but how weird is that? Like, you, sh- you know, she turned him into a grasshopper, really? You know, I don't know. <laughs> okay, what do you do now? I don't know. <laughs> See, for the unbeliever at this time in history, death will be preferable to the misery that's caused by this particular judgment. But it's preferable because people do not understand the intensity and the eternality of hell. 
So rather than kill them outright, the Lord gives them a little taste of hell in hopes that they would repent. Now, as we move on to verse 7, John will give us a comprehensive description of these locusts. I will say this, that these descriptions can be somewhat subjective. You may not agree with me on all points. I'm okay with that. I'm pretty confident you'll agree with me in the synopsis when we get to verse 11 of all these descriptions. So verse 7, we see that they're ready. For John writes, The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. The word shape here, homoyama, it it denotes a similitude, a likeness, or a resemblance. They resembled something like horses prepared for battle. In my mind, I sort of imagine sort of like cavalry horses. They're armored up. They're standing in ranks. They're ready to charge forward. They're just awaiting the command. Now, put yourself in the boots of a person who lived really prior to the 20th century. Cavalries were still in play. And, and, and the sound of, of horses running across a battlefield could easily put enough fear into an opposing force to cause them to break ranks. They could easily overrun an opposing force. And so they have almost a psychological effect that's even greater than the combative effect of the horse itself. And so John seemingly describes these things as as organized and ready to move forward. He also says, on their heads were crowns something like gold. It's not necessarily gold, but something the color of gold, it would seem. The word crowns here is Stephanos. It speaks of the victor's crown, not the diadem, the royal crown. So it's not that they have like a royal uh, quality about them, but they seem to be very formidable. You remember that the Stephanos was given to the winners of like Olympic style games in ancient times. They didn't get gold medals. They got a laurel wreath. That, the glory was in that. And that these locusts have something like that on them. And so it would seem to be indicative of their prowess or their ability to do what they were brought forth to do. Not only that, but they're intelligent. For we read, their faces were like the faces of men. John doesn't say they had human faces, but they had faces that were like the faces of men. This this typically would indicate something of intelligence beyond the animalistic or the instinctive. If there's that intelligence, then there comes the ability to discriminate, to think through, right? Locusts just land, they eat wherever they find something. But these things, they're discriminatory. And I find that particularly fearsome. In in war, you know, there are gravity bombs, dumb bombs. They're dropped passively according to airspeed and altitude, right? But there are also smart weapons that have the ability to make flight adjustments. That's, That's the terrifying stuff, right? Well, you might call these locusts smart weapons. They have that ability to discern, to seek out and to search for those who are upon the earth. Everybody doing good? Yeah, another happy day at Calvary Chapel. <laughs> Verse 8, they had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had women's hair. Now, that typically, in ancient times, it was a figure of speech denoting long hair. I don't think that John is, is using this as a sign of beauty, because long hair on something that looked like this would be terrible. All right, <clears throat> But from about the 4th century on, Roman soldiers started wearing short hair in combat because in close combat, long hair obviously is a liability. It's like you know, going into a fist fight with a hoodie on. No, probably not a good idea, right? Um, but 
you know, the barbarian hordes typically wore long hair, and, and it became emblematic of ferocity. Obviously, Roman soldiers were uh, fairly disciplined in their skills, uh, like the Germanic hordes and, and, and groups like that, not so much. They wore long hair. They dressed very intimidating. Um, and so when John says they, long, they had this long hair, it may be something along those lines that they were fearsome or ferocious might be a, a better understanding. And he says, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. Now, thankfully, they're not biting people, I suppose, and you might think, well, lion's teeth, is that so terrifying? It is if you're the prey, right? So imagine everything that we're looking at so far and now add fangs to it. Can you imagine, listen, honestly, can you imagine anything more terrifying this side of heaven? How much more terrifying would this be in light of the judgments that have already gone out across the earth already by this time? I'm kind of surprised Hollywood hasn't made a movie based on this, you know? But if they did, people would get saved, so that probably answers the question. <clears throat> Not only are they terrifying, but they're also invincible, verse 9. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. Now, iron, of course, is the strongest metal of the ancient world. A breastplate of iron could stop any arrow, any lance, any spear. But it would also be incredibly heavy, obviously, far too cumbersome for a foot soldier to wear. But if you look at a grasshopper, you know, of course, that grasshoppers have an exoskeleton. And so as you look at them, they look almost armored, don't they? They have their individual plates. And so John describes them here as, as being like iron. No doubt talking about the strength of the plates. Now, how do you defend yourself from something like that? You think your 12-gauge is going to help you out? You throw some slugs in it? You think that's going to help you out? You know, these things are armored. You can't defend yourself. He also says, And the sound of their wings was, was like the sound of chariots with many horses running in the battle. A lot of this is very similar to the language you read in Joel chapter 1 and 2. As he describes God's judgment, he describes it in terms of locusts and of horses. <clears throat> but he says, the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and horses running in a battle. There's that thud. There's that sound, you know. And, and in ancient times, as a heavy cavalry would come across the land, you could feel the thud on the ground. And they say that even in, in the modern world, as it relates to locust swarms, that people can hear the swarm before they see it. The steady drone of billions of wings puts people on edge as, as they wait, hoping that the swarm doesn't land in their particular region. Now, I would admit that a lot of this is, sounds pretty far out at this point. Would everybody agree with me? All right. But imagine you're living in this apocalyptic kind of world. You've recently heard of reports of such things on the earth. Maybe you remember friends of the past talking about something like this. Maybe you read it in the Bible years before. Maybe you heard some preacher preaching on it. But you never took it seriously. And then one day, eating freeze-dried food, drinking instant coffee in your concrete bunker, you hear the buzzing, the steady drone of the wings of these things coming your way. Not a good day, is it? Probably the worst day yet. We also know they have bad intentions. Verse 10, they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And the power was to hurt men for five months. John had spoken of this scorpion-like quality and and. Verses 3 and 5, now he gives us a clearer picture. <clears throat> so if it wasn't bad enough, you can add a stinger to the list. Now, normal locusts, they don't have a stinger, right? They've got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. There's, there's really no tail. 
<clears throat> but this is the uh, supernatural and improved version. All right? And it's been given the tail of a scorpion. Now, imagine a scorpion's tail in your mind. What does your mind focus on? The stinger. Yeah. Interesting, huh? And we're told that the power was to hurt men for five months. Uh, if you read this carefully, we're not told that the sting hurts a person for five months, but that the power was given to these creatures to hurt people over the course of five months. <coughs> it's very interesting because how long do you think the life cycle is of an average locust? Five months. And so it, it might be best understood that this judgment will last five months or a single generation of these hellish creatures. And John continues on, he tells us that they have direction, for they had a king over them, and the, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. So these locusts aren't just set loose arbitrarily or randomly, they have a leader who rules over them someone who's calling the shots. And John gives us the name of this particular angel. His name is Abaddon, which literally means destruction. He, the name isn't Satan, interesting. The accuser, Satan, means to accuse, the accuser. Also, in, in, in Greek, his name is Apollyon, which means the destroyer. That's a far more intimidating name than Norton, that's for sure, you know? And, and no doubt this angel earns his name. Pretty scary stuff. As I said, you may not agree with me with the interpretation of all these kind of things, but I will say this, as I continue to move forward in, in learning the Scripture, I just take these things more and more literal unless they use the word like. I believe that these are not helicopters, gang. When I got saved in the Pentecostal church, I got saved in, oh, Bill, these are helicopters, the drone is the sound, you know, all this. And I don't know that they have a king named Apollyon or they come out of a pit or, you know, they're nice, don't get me wrong, but I think people do that because this is so foreign to the human experience, the most they can do is try to equate it to something familiar in the human experience, but that always falls short. These are unprecedented things that are happening here in the world at this particular time. So here's my synopsis, that what John presents to us is awesome, it's supernatural, and it's unimaginably horrific. I think that's the effect that these descriptions are supposed to give us to understand the horror of what people in the future are going to see. And if that wasn't bad enough, John gives us another verse, verse 12, one woe is past, Below, still two more woes are coming after these things. So the fifth trumpet is sounded. Hell has been unleashed on the earth. By the time we get to the sixth and seventh installments, we'll see, well, certainly the sixth installment, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, things will get worse. <clears throat> so the next time then that we get together and study Revelation, be ready to hear worse things, okay? <clears throat> As we study the second half of this chapter. All right. Now, maybe you're listening this morning on the radio. Maybe you're watching our stream. Maybe you're sitting here with us right now, and you're like, Bill, why so much pain? Why so much destruction? Why would a good and loving God subject people to this kind of horror? I think it is best to understand the context of this chapter. And the context of this chapter you find in verses 20 to 21. And there we read this. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Men have had their idols, they've even worshipped demons. Murder and drugs and immorality and theft prevail. They're all the fruits of man's idolatry. The hearts of men continue to grow cold and hardened, and they choose to remain in their sin. 
Well, that doesn't sound like a God of love. He is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And he has to bring judgment. And you know that in your own heart. You know intrinsically that there is a judgment coming. It's just that up till now you haven't wanted to face that reality. I don't have to convince you of heaven or hell. You know it in your heart already. I only have to convince you to listen to what you know in your heart. This is what God is doing. He's judging the earth, and as horrible as it is, He's doing it even now with a certain amount of restraint. Let me ask you a question this morning. How long are you going to hold on to your sin? What is it that you idolize? Are you involved in immorality? Are you a thief? Jesus Christ could come back tonight. I don't want him to. I, on one hand, I do, but I know a lot of people that still haven't come to faith. And I don't want him to on that basis. But he could come back tonight. And the world ultimately will be plunged into this seven-year period that we call the great, well, the tribulation. The last three and a half where we are now in the scriptures is the worst of it. The great tribulation. There's going to be a lot of suffering and there's going to be a lot of pain. God is unleashing it on the earth so that men would understand the reality of eternal punishment, of condemnation. Is your sin that good? that you would hold on to it that tightly? Do you understand the reality of a good and loving God and yet a God who is true and just? There comes a time when you've got to put the internet girl down. You've got to lay aside those things that you think about the most more than God, where you put your time and your energy and your resources. And throw yourself at the mercy of the crucified Son of God who suffered far more miserably than even what we read here. Who took God's judgment for you and extends to you mercy instead. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're a sinner... You're in good company this morning. Amen. But you might be in good company, but that doesn't, that's not gonna, that doesn't make you good, you see. And the wages of sin is death. God will judge sin. You say, well, I'm not that bad of a sinner. Can you jump the Grand Canyon? And then you can't jump the chasm between you and God. The wages of sin is death. That's what you get. That's the prize at the end of the week on payday. You get death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That while you deserve to go to hell, God has given you an option and is putting your faith in Jesus Christ who went to the cross for you. Not just for mankind, for you. And he endured it for you. If you'll put your faith in him, you won't get condemnation eternal. You get eternal life. Not because you're good, but because He is. He takes the test for you. And now you're in Christ. No better place to be. The Bible says that God demonstrates His love for you and I, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, it is true that greater love has no man than this, that He laid down His life for His friends, but God laid down His life for His enemies. That's a, that's a love that's far beyond me. And that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. You catch that? While I was a sinner, while I was an insolent pub crawler in Europe, Christ died for me. And I grew up with this idea that if I just learned the Lord's Prayer, Apostles' Creed, a few others, if I memorized the Ten Commandments, you know, made, made my... Uh, this is a class we couldn't, uh, confirmation, yeah, yeah. Then, then, then God would accept me, you know, kind of like getting a haircut and a suit and a job, taking a shower, and then God would somehow accept me or something like that. And yet the Bible says, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand the love he has for you? 
He loves you so much, he put me up here to preach one of the most difficult portions of Scripture, that you would understand his love for you. Do you understand? Why hold on to your sin? In the end, it stinks. It promises you a, a minute or two of, of fun. It always comes out to bitterness in the end, doesn't it? You got a chip on your shoulder? Flick it off. You're holding a grudge? Let it go. Amen? In light of the one who died for you. I'm not going to play some kind of pulpit theatrics here and somehow get you to respond. I'm giving you the truth. Your, your job is to take this to God and respond with Him. Amen? You're just a prayer away. In your prayer, acknowledge that you're a sinner. Acknowledge that you deserve to go to hell. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for you. and Put your faith there. And receive a new life. An eternal life. Amen? How many of you want to live forever? You do. Well, yeah, in, in, in the eternal sense. I don't want to live forever on this earth. I, not, I don't want to be like that stupid Greek mythology, you know. <laughs> Changed into a bug or something. Yeah, yeah, there are worldviews that believe that. Be reincarnated, come back as a bug, you know. No, I don't think so. Amen? Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through. Is he Lord? Is he a liar or is he a lunatic? I keep looking at it. Keeps proving true, right? He is the Lord. Amen? All right, my Lord, thank you then for getting us through the first half of this chapter, Lord. These are horrible things to read, Lord. Um, and, and I don't believe that, that you do it with, without a heavy heart. But I pray, my Lord, as we read this, that all the more we would be Motivated to share the gospel. To see people spared your judgment, Lord. On the earth and eternally as well. For those who are among us, Lord, who haven't truly put their faith in you. May today be that day. Spare us all from playing church, Lord. May we just get right with you, Lord. And, and find your mercy and your grace to live the life that you've called us to live, my Lord. As day grow, the days grow dark, I pray, Lord, that we as believers would shine brightly, sharing your word, sharing words of grace and hope and peace in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.